we gather on the first Lord's Day after the November 8, 2016 election of Donald John Trump and Mike Pence as President and Vice President, respectively, of the United States. Five days ago, few people believed this result likely, even among the political elite. So we gather for worship on a Lord's Day after many people have been stunned, whether joyously or sadly. Since Mr. Trump and Mr. Pr Mr. Pence were elected last Tuesday, news outlets have reported a marked upsurge in acts of hate and bigotry. Women, persons who are LGBT, persons from racial minority groups who are perceived to be Muslims, immigrants, persons who have been viewed as disabled, have been subjected to verbal abuse. Property has been defaced with hateful slurs. Protests have been held in various cities across the United States, attended by people who are distressed about what Mr. Trump's presidency portends for peace, equality, societal concern for the vulnerable and the marginalized. We are living in a distressing time. We gather on the first Lord's Day after the November 12, 2016 declaration of a mistrial in the murder trial of Ray Tensing, the white former University of Cincinnati police officer who shot to death Samuel DuBose, an unarmed black motorist last year. The jury of 10 white people and two black people were unable to agree whether Tensing murdered DuBose or not, despite having seen body cam video graphically showing Tenzing aiming his service weapon at DeBose's vehicle while more than an arm's length away from it, refuting his allegation that he was afraid he was going to be dragged away. On this Lord's Day, many people are disappointed and view the hung jury and mistrial as the latest proof that black lives do not matter in this society when it comes to law enforcement. We are living in a distressing time. As of this Lord's Day, Michael Poor, the, the person appointed by Johnny Key, the appointed commissioner of the Arkansas Department of Education as superintendent of the Little Rock School District, the largest and most racially diverse in Arkansas, is proceeding with plans to close or repurpose five schools located in Central and Southwest Little Rock. None of Mr. Poor's actions have been presented to, let alone approved by, democratically elected representatives of the Little Rock School District voters. Since the moment he was appointed by the Commissioner Key, after the Department of Education's Board of Education dissolved the democratically elected school board on January 28th, 2015, almost two years ago. We are living in a distressing time. It is a, distress, a distressing time for people who care about social justice. We're living in a distressing time for people who care about democracy. We're living in a, a distressing time for people who care about women and girls, people who are black and brown, immigrant, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, disabled, frail due to sickness, disease, and injury, people who are otherwise marginalized and vulnerable. We are living in a distressing time for peace in the United States and across the world. The whole world is more scared. Everybody's blood pressure's gone up. Whether you're on medication or not. Hello, you take your pill this morning? So what can prophetic people learn from Jesus about how to behave in this distressing time? I'm so glad you asked me. The setting for the lesson we read from Luke's gospel is full of political drama. It took place in Jerusalem, the capital city of Judea, a few days after this account Jesus would be arrested based on falsified evidence 
for the political crime of insurrection against the Roman government. His enemies would, within the Jewish religious establishment, would urge that he be condemned to die. Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, would order the crucifixion despite knowing that Jesus was not guilty of insurrection or any other crime. So, when Jesus heard some people talking about how much a big thing it was of his big, beautiful temple in Jerusalem with his ornate stones and his other prized objects, and then he predicted that the temple would be demolished at some future time, some who heard his words were distressed. They wanted to know when that ominous event would happen and what its threatening signs would be. They asked him, teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? The people who heard Jesus predicted the Jerusalem temple would be destroyed wanted to know what the warning signs would be for such a politically and culturally and religiously devastating and distressing event. You see, people with good sense want to know the warning signs for troubling events and conditions. We want to know the warning signs for life-threatening illnesses. We want to know the warning signs for weather changes, weather alerts that let us know that storms are on the horizon. We want warning signs, and we want to know how to interpret those signs. We want to know what a tornado warning means. What's the difference between a tornado warning and a tornado alert? We want to know what a flash flood warning means. So the people who heard Jesus predict that the Jerusalem temple would be destroyed wanted to know what events and actions would signal that threat to the cultural and the religious heritage of the Jewish people. They were thinking about the loss of their most cherished religious, political, and cultural landmark. They heard Jesus speak about it being demolished at some future time. They were desperate to know what the warning signs would be for such a cataclysmic event. And who can blame them for wanting to know? The people who heard Jesus talk about the eventual destruction of the great temple in Jerusalem were not thinking about the end of the world. Let me say that again, in case you missed it. They were not thinking about the end of the world. They were thinking about the loss of their temple, their religious, their cultural, and their political landmark. They were thinking about the loss of a religious edifice that King Herod started rebuilding 19 years before Jesus was born. The rebuilding project more than doubled the size of the Temple Mount. While work on the temple itself took 18 months, work on other courts where people could gather for various purposes like speech making and healing would continue throughout the lifetime of Jesus until 62 to 64 C.E., after the life of Jesus. But less than 10 years after everything had been completed on the Herodian temple, the Romans would destroy it in 70 C.E. The Romans plundered it on its furnishings and hauled them to Rome. The Romans sacked it and then visually portrayed the siege and burning of Jerusalem in large paintings that were Paraded, paraded on wagons in a triumphal procession that went all the way from Judea to Rome in 71 CE. When Jerusalem and its temple were destroyed in 70 CE, followers of Jesus thought back to what Jesus had predicted in today's lesson, and that's what we're reading about. Now, I suspect that more than a few folks may be upset by learning that this passage is not about the end of the world. It has been often preached and studied and taught 
from that point of view. And that's probably because every generation somehow figures that its time marks the end of history. Do you recall Prince? The pop music genius known as Prince famously set that thinking to music in his song 1999, about the end of the 20th century. Do you not remember these words? Everybody's got a bum, we could all die any day, oh. But before I let that happen, I'll dance my life away. Oh, ho, they say 2000, zero, zero, party's over, oops, out of time. But before, but tonight, I'm going to party like it's, I wasn't the only one who heard him. Say it one more time. 2,000, zero, zero, party's over, oops, out of time. So tonight I'm going to party like it's, As someone accurately put it, only a genius like Prince could drop protest thoughts about the constant threat of war into a dance tune. Everybody's got a bomb. We could all die any day. Oh, but before I let that happen, I'll dance my life away. Hmm. <laughs> my point, I know you wanted my point, my point, and I think what Jesus was emphasizing is that we tend to view objective threats to our political, cultural, and religious icons as omens of the apocalypse, the end of time. But Jesus warned us not to do so in these words. Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. In other words, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. Don't get twisted out of shape when threats to our political and our cultural and our religious structures happen and folks show up claiming in, the, in God's name at that to be some version of Jesus. Don't get bent out of shape when Mr. Trump or some other politician a religious personality shows up claiming to be the savior of the world needs just because Jesus said the temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed. Don't run around like Chicken Little. You recall Chicken Little. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Because Ray Tensing wasn't found guilty of murdering Samuel DeBose despite the body cam video showing he shot DeBose in the head while feet away from the car DeBose was driving. Don't think the world is coming to an end because white supremacists and their black cronies on the Board of Education hijacked the governance of the state's largest school district from its majority black voters. Yeah, this stuff is distressing. Yes, it's messed up. Yes, it's jacked up, as the folks say. But that doesn't mean the world is about to end. Jacked up stuff has happened before. Hello? Hello? Anybody remember Orville Fathers? Hello? Anybody remember Andrew Jackson? The Trail of Tears? Right down on Colonel Glen Road? A whole nation of people were marched at gunpoint from Florida to Oklahoma. Anybody remember Andrew Johnson and the end of Reconstruction? Hello? Jacked up stuff has happened before. I'm so glad McAllister took the babies out. <laughs> yes, Donald Trump appears likely to be a singularly unjust president. I did say it. Yes, he claims to be the answer to everything from income inequality to immigration struggles. Yes, he bragged about being able to sexually assault women and girls because he's rich and famous. None of that means that the world is about to end because he was elected on November the 8th, 2016. 
It merely means voters elected someone who appears likely to be a singularly unjust president. However distressing that must be to people, including followers of Jesus, who care about love and justice. Jesus predicted there would be reports of wars and insurrections before the great temple in Jerusalem that Herod expanded was demolished. He warned there would be natural disasters, great earthquakes in various places, famines and plagues. There would be dreadful portents and signs from heaven. Jesus said that before all those things happened, his followers would be targeted for persecution. Remember? But before all this happens, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings and governors because of my name. Jesus warned his followers those events would happen before the temple was demolished. Those events were not considered omens for the end time. So what does Jesus' words have to do with us? What was Jesus saying for us? Look at Luke 21 and 13. You're going to see something. As the old preacher said, we're going to help you. Look at 21 and 13. When you get there, say, I got it. You find these words. This will give you an opportunity to testify. Anybody remember M.C. Hammer? I've quoted Prince. Anybody remember M.C. Hammer? M.C. Hammer would say, it's hammer time. It's hammer time, and he'd bust a move. Right? He would say, it's hammer time here, and he'd bust a move. Now, I'm not going to do that. I am not going to bust some M.C. Hammer moves. No, 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 I'm not going to do it. Faye, I'm not going to do it. You can't make me do it. No, no. The distressing events Jesus predicted were not to be considered reasons for his followers to hide or be fearful. Jesus said they would be opportunities. Check that, check that, check that. This will give you an opportunity to testify. This will give you an opportunity to be the prophetic people I've called you to be. Jesus said there will be opportunities for moral witness about God's love and God's justice. Jesus was warning about these things to challenge his followers to be vigilant and courageous witnesses in the face of all the distressing events he predicted they would experience. It's prophetic time, folks. It's prophetic time. It's not fearing time. It's prophetic time. It's stand up and speak up time. It's not high time. It's stand up and show up and speak up time. Early this morning, I'm not going to tell you how early because some of you believe I don't sleep enough. Hit dogs holler. Early this morning, I opened an email message from Reverend Gilbert Caldwell. You recall Gil Caldwell, the 83-year-old United Methodist champion for justice we met during the conference New Millennium hosted in April on affirming and embracing the LBGT community in the black church. Gil Caldwell sent me and other people a link to a blog post titled, check this, White Christians Who Voted for Donald Trump, Fix This Now. By Reverend John Pavlo Pavlovich, a member of the pastoral staff, a pastor of a white non-denominational evangelical church in, of all places, Raleigh, North Carolina. I know you wanted to put that on there, right? You won't know what that brother had to say, didn't you? You want to know? I'm so glad you want to know, because I'm going to tell you. Let me tell you what this preacher wrote. And I will tell you that I am quoting him directly, so don't you say that I said this. Okay? Title. White Christians who voted for Donald Trump fix this now. It's dated November the 10th. 
2016, two days after the election. Here you go. And by the way, you can't see it, but that's, that's a picture of a black, black little boy. Quote, we Christians like to talk about hell a lot, so let's talk about hell a little. Yesterday, referring to November the 9th, in the very first daylight hours after Donald Trump's election victory, it began. Near San Francisco, a home in Noe Valley flew a Nazi flag where kids walked by to get to school. A white middle school student brought a Trump sign to school and told a black classmate it was time for him to get, quote, back in place. A gay New York City man getting on a bus was told he should, quote, enjoy the concentration camp spirit, close quote. A female seminary student was stopped at a coffee shop with the wilds, quote, smile, sweetheart, we beat the cunt, close quote. Seminary student, parents of color spent the day, parents of children of color spent the day picking up their children early from elementary, middle, and high schools across the country because they were inundated with slurs and harassment and unable to study. A group of Hispanic kids in Raleigh were taunted by white children telling them they were, quote, going back to Mexico, close quote. This is the personal hell we've unleashed upon our people this week. And if you're a white Christian and you voted for Donald Trump, you need to fix this now. You comprise the lion's share of Trump's ele elevation to the highest office of our country. You knew exactly who this man was when you held your noses and covered your eyes and endorsed him anyway. You are fully responsible for the flood of personal sewage now engulfing children and adults of color, those in the LBG2 community those in the Muslim community, and you white Christians better get your spiritual, he said it right, your spiritual shit together and figure out how you're going to make this right. Pastor wrote this. Pastor wrote this. White preacher. Now I know this. Y'all think this is me, okay? I do talk like this. Yeah, I do talk like this. But I want you to know there's more than one people. There's at least, there's at least two of us talking like this, okay? But he wasn't done. He writes, let's be clear about something, brethren. This is not the time to appeal to minorities and marginalized communities to come together in unity with white people right now. That was Hillary Clinton's message. And even though she had the track record and the experience and the wherewithal to make it happen, you passed on it. Instead, you chose the guy whose entire resume is about supremacy and privilege, whose entire campaign was about the fear of the other, the other in this case being anyone not white, not straight, and Christian. You chose the guy endorsed by the KKK. You did. You need to understand this. Oppressed people aren't obliged to, be, to make nice with their oppressors. The bullied don't owe anything to the bullies. Victims don't have to make their assailants feel better. Young people of color aren't responsible to educate racist children or their parents. In the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells his listeners that those who followed after him, those who would bear his name, are to love the least, not those who are less than, but those who are treated as less than. He then paints the picture of the eternal suffering Christians are so always willing to condemn others too. And he says that it will be their lack of love and compassion and mercy for those most vulnerable, most hurting people that will condemn them. White Christians in the white church, especially if you voted for Donald Trump, this is all on you. Your pastors need to speak clearly and explicitly into this now. Your church websites and social media pages need to address this harassment and bullying and terrorizing now. You need to talk to your white children and teach them how, to, how not to be horrible to other kids and how to stand up to those who are being horrible now. You need to talk to your kids' coaches and to your midweek Bible study and to your coworkers and your church staff and your gun club 
I need to call out this poison now. White churches, this Sunday, your only sermon should be the one that reminds your white members what the parable of the Good Samaritan was compelling followers of Jesus to be. Radically merciful when everyone else looked the other way. You need to reach out to your neighbors and coworkers and classmates and social media friends who are part of the marginalized communities and reassure them, listen to them, care for them, and be Jesus to them. If not, no matter how you rationalize it or try to squeeze your way out of it, the personal hell so many people are living in and will continue to live in for the next four years will be one of your design. It will be your shared sin. The blood will be on your hands. This is your time and place in history to show people what Jesus is supposed to look like. This is your urgent moment to make a testimony that is Christ-like or to willingly and openly deny Christ. This is your crucial opportunity to be the peacemakers, white Christians, not by compelling the marginalized people to be more understanding or to ask them to come to the table with those who are injuring them, but by de speaking directly into the face of those inflicting the injury and demanding their repentance. Now, you can dismiss these stories or diminish their collateral damage or accuse the victims of exaggeration. You can claim that things will die down once these people, quote, get this out of the system, close quote. You can turn away and log out and retreat into the cloistered security of your white Christian bubble of privilege. Or you can step out into the school hallways and bus stops and coffee shops and Twitter feeds and bring the bold, loving, redemptive presence of Jesus you're always claiming you want to be in the world. You can actually step into hell and bring the freaking love of God. At times like these, Christians like to smile sweetly and say, God is in control. No, God is not in control. God didn't vote for Donald Trump. You did. Stop passing the buck to God. God isn't defacing prayer rooms. God isn't toning gay teenagers. God isn't bullying kids on buses. God isn't threatening Muslim families. White Christians are. You are in control of this. You have pulpits and pews and a voice and influence and social media, so get to work. You need to do some knee-to-the-dirt exploratory surgery with your maker and figure out how you're going to respond to this, and then you need to respond. For the love of God and for the love of the people you claim that God so loves, Fix this now. Now, I don't know whether God's going to have a pulpit tomorrow. I want you to know something. I want to come preach here. I want that brother to come preach here. Donald Trump does appear to be likely to be a leading administration that would be insensitive, if not hateful. And yes, white people who profess to be followers of Jesus flock to vote for him. But that doesn't mean the world's about to end. It means that white people, along with any other followers of Jesus, have opportunities to be prophetic witnesses about God's love and justice. We have prophetic time. Jesus said, this is your opportunity to be a witness. This is an opportunity to be in the faces of folks and say, no, no, no. The love of God doesn't look like this mess. The love of God doesn't act this way. The justice of God does not. You cannot hang this stuff on God. And it's our opportunity to do that. Criminal justice system doesn't seem to act right. Not fair. It's our opportunity to say, hey, black lives matter. And yes, we're going to say black lives matter, whether you don't like it or not. Because God says it. Public education is under attack, yes, from white supremacists and pre free market capitalists and the subservient black blackies, because there's some black folks in there too, with them women too, all right? There are always some Uncle Toms and Uncle Tom, uh, Uncle But that doesn't mean the world's about to end. It means we have opportunities to be protesting and prophetically unafraid to challenge the forces of power and supremacy people who are not going to flinch and cower in the face of racist and homophobic and xenophobic bigotry. 
in other words, as MC said, is hammer time. It's prophetic witness time. Now, bust a move. 